What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today I have a video for you that should hopefully be pretty interesting to watch and helpful. Today I have a full PC build guide for you, the price point is $400 and I'm going to go over the parts, teach you how to build it, and show you how it performs in some games. This build is in partnership with Micro Center, they're not paying me for this video but they did provide a few parts for this build and I'll be going off Micro Center pricing for this build. If you have a Micro Center near you I would highly recommend you go check it out, they have some really good deals but but even if you don't live near a micro center you can still build this PC but it might cost you a little bit more. This PC is going to offer a crazy amount of value for the money and unlike a lot of the builds on the channel this one is using all new parts and is a great system for first time PC builders and people who want to dip their toes in the world of PC gaming. With all that out of the way I'm going to start by talking about the parts that make up the system. For the CPU we're going with something that will provide great gaming performance and will also be good for some entry level content content creation and streaming. What I went with is the Ryzen 5 1600. Yes, this is two generations old, but the value for money this is offering is incredible. It's a 6 core 12 thread overclockable CPU based on the Zen 1 architecture. Currently at Micro Center this CPU is $80 which is an incredible price for what you're getting. Going with a first gen Ryzen CPU also gives you the option to upgrade to a newer Zen 2 CPU later down the line. For the motherboard I went with what is probably my favorite AM4 motherboard. I've ever used. This is the ASRock B450M Pro 4. This is a really full featured board for only $75 and you get an additional $30 off at Micro Center for bundling it with a CPU. This board has 4 DIMM slots, 2 M.2 slots, good back panel I.O. and a number of other awesome features. Not only this but the VRM setup on this guy actually isn't half bad. I used this board in the sleeper PC build and was able to get a Ryzen 7 2700 up to 4 GHz stable with the stock cooler so overclocking capabilities for the price are incredible. Incredible. And finally, I really like the way it looks. It has a very neutral color scheme, so most parts you pair with it are going to look good. Moving on to RAM, budget builders are very lucky right now because RAM is very affordable and is around half the price it was just a year or two ago. Right now, you're able to get a 2x4GB kit like this at 3000 MHz for right around 40 bucks. This is Team Group Vulcan Z RAM that offers great value for the money and is what I've used in the past for a few builds. It fits with our color scheme, performs great, and overall works well in the build. Yes, 16 gigabytes would have been ideal, but it wasn't possible with this budget. If you have $25 more to spend on this build, going up to 16 gigabytes of RAM would probably be the first upgrade I would go for. In terms of storage, I have a hard time not recommending an SSD in 2019, even in a budget system like this one. What I went with is an Inland Premium 256 gigabyte M.2 SSD. At around $35, we're getting a NVMe M.2 SSD with DRAM, which makes this a great boot drive. 256 gigabytes to me is the perfect amount to start with on a budget build as it gives you enough space for your OS, applications, and a number of games. I find 128 gigabytes too limiting, especially if it's the only drive you're starting with. Also when you decide you need more space you can pop a hard drive in there for mass storage later down the line. I also like M.2 drives as they're super simple to install and you don't have to worry about routing and managing the two cables you would use for a normal SATA drive. Moving on to the graphics card. This is also a place where price to performance compared to a couple years ago is incredible. Now that we're well past the crypto mining bubble, the GPU market is, in my opinion, in a pretty good place. What I went with is the AMD RX 570 4GB from PowerColor. This is the Red Dragon model and for around 120 bucks, this offers great performance for the money, being able to play most any game at 1080p 60fps depending on the in-game settings. The only other option around this price point is the GTX 1650, and while the 1650 does offer better efficiency, the RX 570 is more powerful and costs slightly less. The card aesthetically is also very nice, it has an almost all black design with a backplate and looks great in my opinion. To power the system, I went with a 430 watt 80 plus certified power supply from Thermaltake for $40. Power supplies are kind of expensive right now because of the tariffs. Normally you could get a unit like this one for $20 to $30, but even at $40 it's still an okay deal and fits into our budget. 430 watts is plenty for this build.
build and this is a relatively reliable unit that works well. It's not modular and the cables aren't the most visually pleasing, but it gets the job done and in a budget build that's pretty much all that matters. Finally, let's talk about the case. This is the Rosewill FBM X2. At $30, this case offers a minimalistic design and is pretty easy to build in. There isn't any side panel window, but again, this is a $30 case so there needs to be compromises somewhere. It has a very open interior layout, one included fan, and overall feels pretty sturdy. There are always a number of $30 or less cases on Newegg. These change week to week so you can just pick one that looks the best to you. This set of parts gives you a great starter PC with room to upgrade and build upon. Because some of you may be building this, I decide to also include a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to put it together. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver, this will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Now let's talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule cleared, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. I like to start with opening the case as I want this ready to go as soon as I'm ready to drop the board into place. Just take the case out of the box, remove the foam and plastic coverings, and place these pieces back into the box. Next, remove the two thumb screws on the back of the case for each panel. Place these thumb screws in a safe location and remove the side panels one at a time. I like to place these back in the box for safekeeping. I especially like to do this with side panel windows because this prevents the chance of kicking it or it falling over and scratching or breaking. You're now left with an open case ready to be built in. Next, remove the pack of screws that are inside. Take the standoffs that look like this out of the screw bag. All the standoff holes were filled on this case except for two, so I needed to add those. You can just put these in hand by making them finger tight. Once these are in, I leave the case here and bring my attention to the motherboard. First, I open the box and take out the IO shield. You line this up at the back of the case. You know it's right side up if all of the evenly spaced openings are at the bottom. Bottom. After lined up, you pop it into place by pushing each corner in until it's secure. I like to do this now because if you forget to do it and build the whole computer, then it's a big pain to install it afterwards. Next, you can set the case aside and bring your focus back to the motherboard. The motherboard's what most everything connects to in some way. Take out the board itself and the manual. Take the motherboard out and set it on the motherboard box. The first thing to install is our CPU. Get the CPU box out and open. Grab out the clamshell. CPU case. Before getting the CPU completely out, push down and out on the AM4 socket arm and lift up so the arm is perpendicular to the board. Next, go ahead and take out your CPU, handling it only by the edges and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Set the CPU into place and apply no pressure, it should just drop in by itself. Another way to know the CPU is lined up before dropping it in is by having the Ryzen logo closest to and parallel with the top large end of the socket. Pocket. Once in, lower the lever arm back down and make sure it clips into place under the notch. Now it's time to install our cooler. But before this is done, we need to remove the four screws on the standard AM4 mounting brackets. Once these screws are out, lift these two pieces of plastic out, but leave the back plate in place. If your CPU is new, it will already have thermal paste applied to the cooler. I've used mine before, so it doesn't. In that case, I need to add a pea size amount of thermal paste. But for new coolers, the pre-applied thermal paste will work just fine. Line up the screws on the cooler with the standoffs in the back plate. Lower this into place with the Ryzen logo either facing to the right or the left. Once lowered in and lined up, tighten down the four screws going in a cross pattern until tightened down. Next, locate the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard and grab the CPU fan cable. Line the notch in the header with the notch on the fan connector and push it into place. This shouldn't require a lot of force, so make sure you don't force it in, as you could bend pins. Next up is to install the RAM. We have two sticks and we'll be using the second and fourth slots from the left. 
Open up the top clip on both slots and grab one of the ram sticks. Align the notch in the slot with the notch in the ram stick and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's in the slot, press down on both sides until you hear a click and see the clip close. Repeat this with your other stick of ram. This leaves you with two open slots to easily upgrade in the future. Next up, it's time to install our SSD. Get out your SSD and your smaller screwdriver for this step. Remove the pre-installed M.2 screw from the M.2 slot that says Ultra M.2. This is the only PCIe one as the other slot only supports SATA drives. Line the notches in the M.2 drive with the notch in the slot. At a 45 degree angle, insert the M.2 drive into the slot and lower it down to the standoff. Reinstall the screw into place and boom, your SSD is installed. It's now time to install the motherboard into the case. I like to install this first and hook up the front panel connectors before installing the power supply just so it's easier to work with. With the case sitting on its side, lower the motherboard in, lining the I.O. up with the I.O. shield and lower it into place. Make sure you can see the motherboard standoffs you installed earlier through the holes. Next, get out your motherboard screws that look like this. These should have the more fine threading. Install one screw in each exposed standoff. It may seem overkill using all of these, but it keeps the motherboard nice and secure. Now it's time to install our front panel connectors. Route the USB 3 cable that looks like this through through the back and out the hole right here. Align the notch on the connector and the notch on the header together and press the cable into place. Next, take the other three cables and route them through the back to this hole right here. Find the header towards the bottom left of the board that says HD Audio and find the block connector that also says HD Audio. Align the layout of the pins on the header and the connector and then press the cable into place. Next, grab the cable that says USB 2 and locate one of the USB 2 headers on the motherboard. Just like with HD audio, align the pins on the header with the corresponding holes in the connector and press it into place. Once this is done, the front panel connectors are next. Referring to the manual, install each connector on the specified pin. This is probably the most annoying part of the build, and I really wish these front panel connectors came in a block that you just press in all at once. Now that all the front panel connectors are in, it's time to direct our attention to the power supply. Get the unit out of the box and get all the connectors loose. Pull aside the 24 pin that looks like this, the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this, and the PCIe cable that looks like this. The rest of the cables can be bundled back up as we don't need them for this configuration. Now it's time to install the PSU. Because this is bottom mounted, you can either mount it fan facing up or down. I decide to mount it with the fan up to add a little bit of extra exhaust for the system as there is only one included fan, but again, installing it either way should be perfectly fine. I just slid it into place and then installed four of these screws into the back in each hole. Now feed the 8 pin CPU cable and the 24 pin through this hole to the back of the case. Take the 24 pin, which is the biggest one, and route it to this hole right here. You want to make sure the little breakaway piece is pushed together to make one big connector. Then line the notch in both the cable and the header up and plug it in. This is hard to see, so I also demonstrated this on a motherboard outside of its case to give you guys a better look. Next, take the 8 pin CPU cable and route it to the top left hole of the case here. Plug it in with both notches lined up. Again, this is hard to see, so here is another angle of an 8 pin CPU cable being plugged in. Because the PCIe cable isn't routed through the back of the case, we can now cable manage the back. I just use the included zip ties, or as The Verge would say, tweezers to neaten up the cables as flat as possible, just so the side panel will be able to slide back on. I tested to make sure the panel would fit, then snipped off the ends of the zip ties. Now we're finally ready to install our graphics card. Go ahead and lay the case back onto its side, then unscrew the PCIe retention bracket. This slides up and down, but sometimes it gets in the way, so I I just like to remove it all together when installing the card. I need the second and third slots from the top open, and these are breakaway PCIe covers which you just bend back and forth until they snap off. Make sure to do this for both slots. Next, open up the PCIe retention clip on the 16x PCIe slot. Grab your graphics card and line the notch on the card's connector with the notch in the PCIe slot. 
Once this is lined up, just press the card into place. Now use two of the same type of screws you use for the power supply to secure the graphics card, and then you can reattach the sliding PCIe cover we removed before if you want. Now go ahead and grab the last loose cable which has the two 8-pin PCIe connectors on it. I use the second one from the end. Group the 2-pin part with the 6-pin part so it's one 8-pin, then press it into place, again lining the notch on both pieces together. Now go ahead and tuck the other part of the cable neatly away and you are successfully done building your PC. Last thing to do with actually building it is just reinstalling the side panels. One tip I'll give you is to put all of the component boxes inside of the case box. This will allow you to keep them all in case you need to make a return or RMA apart in the future, and it keeps all of the boxes relatively compact in one place. Once built, you need to install Windows 10. I use unactivated Windows 10, which I have a full video about, and the only downside to this is a little watermark in the bottom right of your screen. Other than that, it performs forms the same as a fully activated copy of Windows. I'll leave a link to a few tutorials on how to do this in the description down below. So now that you've learned about the parts and how to build it, it's now time for the benchmarks. I tested a few different games using the built-in benchmarks, and if you want to see other specific games tested in the future, let me know in the comment section down below. So without further ado, here are the benchmarks. So as you guys can see, for $400, the system performs really well in games. It may even be able to do a little streaming, so if that's something you'd like to see me try, let me know in the comment section down below. Overall, this build offers great price to performance for only $400 if you live near a micro center. Again, you can totally build this PC if you don't, but it'll probably cost you around $50 more. Even so, for a new PC that performs like this, that's a great deal. Again, thank you to Micro Center for providing some of the parts and all of links to parts used in the description down below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up, as well as consider subscribing. And this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.